Thanks very much, everybody, and for coming along. Before we get talking to these two amazing people, Douglas and Stefan, um, what do we know of the word oscillation? If I were to ask you what that means to you, would you be able to describe it back to me, or what, what you conceive that word to be? Wobble. Pardon me? Wobble. Wobble, brilliant. What else? Vibration. Vibration, excellent. Anything else? That's okay, wobble and vibration, I'll, I'll take those too. But you have a great uh, little experiment that you'd like to do with the audience, wouldn't you, Douglas, before we get cracking? I thought we'd start off with a little demonstration. So we need three people. Can I get three brave people to come up? Come on, three, don't make me pick. <laughs> you moved come, your come, coat. Come. Yeah, one, I had my... two, and one more. One more, one more. Three, Lovely. come on up. Okay, so come up here come on the on stage. So we actually asked people in the gallery but before the show started what oscillator means, and we got a lot of different answers, but one of the main answers was, I don't know what oscillator means, um, which was a little bit of concern from a, a sort of PR standpoint, um, but that's okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to build an oscillator right here. So first, let's start with the two of you. Okay, so look facing one another, and you, you have two states. You're able to either raise your arm or lower your arm, okay? So what I want you to do first is you, I'm going to give you a rule. And the rule right now is you both do what the other person does. OK? So we'll start right now. Whoa, whoa, just, just only do, don't, so don't do anything. Don't, don't purposely do anything. So if your rule is both do what the other does, do it. Oh, well, don't, so, you're, so you're adding to it. Don't add anything. I, you, I don't want you to expect anything to happen. Ready? So, 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 so nothing's going to happen, is what I'm trying to say. Okay? <laughs> you don't need to perform. You're a robot right now. Okay? Okay, so nothing happens. If your rule is both of you do what the other does, nothing happens. Here, we'll substitute. Let's give them a different rule now. Now the rule is do the opposite of what the other person does. Okay? So look at each other. And you're only allowed to either raise your hand or lower your hand. So now do the opposite of what one another do. So look at her. So, so if her hand is down, your hand should be up, yeah? Okay. Okay, so your hand goes up. Okay, you're kind of stuck, right? Mm. Okay. You see what's happening? It's a little bit confusing, I think. <laughs> Let's add the third person in. So we have two states where nothing's happening, basically. Be better. So now let's have a third. Okay, now you're looking here. This is getting a little more complicated than expected. So you're looking at her. Yes. She's looking at you. Yeah. You're looking at her. Yeah. Okay. So your rule, just yeah. do what she does. If her hand is up, you put your hand up. Okay. If her hand is down, you put your hand down. Okay. You do the opposite of what she does. If her hand is up, you put your hand down. <laughs> if her hand is down, you put your hand up. You do the same as what she does. Okay. okay. So now start. Keep, keep going. You're doing the opposite, remember? Okay, so we've made an oscillator. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So you can see it still is a little hard for people to get their heads around, but basically that was a, what you could call a logical operator. You can make different kinds of situations like that, give them simple rules, and if they follow those rules, you're going to get these different kinds of effects, one of which in this case is this kind of ring, and they're going to go up and down forever. Right? So that's a kind of a straightforward, apparently it's a little harder <laughs> um, to get together sometimes than others, but that's a, a rather straightforward idea of, of what sort of at the very core an oscillator is. It's something that's, that's repetitive, that's happening over and over again. It's some sort of system that has this kind of recirculation or this feedback to it. it it's something that in physics we, we call a frustrated state because you can do what, what you're supposed to do with one person, yeah. but then you're out of sync with the other person, so you've got to do something else. Right. You're, not, you're not stable in that state. Right. You're somehow between these mm -hmm. two. You switch between two states. It's trying to adjust itself. It's trying to fit something, but as soon as it fits, yeah. something else something changes. Something else doesn't fit. Right, yes. and so it kind of flip-flops back yeah. and forth. So, um, so is, it, is it about patterns, is it? is it? You were saying in your notes that when you were young um, that you were always looking for patterns in life. Is, is that what, what this exhibition is all about? Is that, is that the core of the different pieces? It's, it's certainly an indicator, I think, that, that there's something of interest, right? If you're looking at the world, at whatever level you're looking at it, uh, if you see something that strikes you as a pattern, 
it kind of tells you there's, somehow there's information there, right? There's something that's happening. It's not just noise. Of course, it can be hard to perceive whether there's something deeper in the noise than, than you know, as a human just looking at something. But if something strikes you, if you saw something happening over and over again, you would think something's causing that, it, right? It's something that happens with a certain periodicity in time. Something is repeating. It's yeah. not, never going to repeat exactly the same, but it might if you have a, if you have a very simple pendulum. Don't like, take your belt off there. Well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no, you take the belt off that. That's later for the performance. Oh, brilliant. That's my simple pendulum here. So there is yeah. something rather repetitive. Now, if I swing a bit further, it's not quite as repetitive, and you have problems predicting that. Right. Yes. But there's, it's, it's about something that is repeating, and thereby we can sort of filter it out of the, of the noise. That's and you're, you're, you're drawn to it, and you imagine there's a, there's a reason for it. Yeah. You know, and to me, that's the thing that's fascinating, is you can look at the world, and you can perceive there's a reason for this thing I'm seeing, but now my job is kind of, well, how do I get to that reason, and is it accessible to mm. you? We use the word pattern on clothes a lot, things like that, yeah. and if you think of something you know, wallpaper patterns, for instance, repeat themselves. If you had wallpaper that never repeated, it would be a very strange thing because it wouldn't feel, you know, you, you'd, you'd feel like you could never quite get a handle on what it was doing. Yeah, right? I, I know, I definitely, I don't know about the rest of you out there, but I know I definitely like to look for patterns and things, you know, and count things and find. So, so that's kind of appealing to my inner oscillatory self, right. perhaps. So tell me, how did we get here? We're here today after presumably a, a huge amount of work from the two of you to pull all those beautiful uh, pieces of work in the exhibition together. So, so can you just take me through kind of a brief timeline of, of your collaboration as curators to get all this to, to come to pass? Sure, about a year ago, I, I've done previous shows with Michael John Gorman, who's the director of the Science Gallery, who's here. We've actually worked together before Science Gallery even existed. And uh, then we did an early Science Gallery show called Artbots here. And I wrote to the team about a year or so ago, yeah kind of just with a proposal saying there's, I've been thinking about this show that could happen around the idea of oscillators and, and I had a long list of oscillators in lots of different domains, in physics and chemistry and biology and of course in the arts. And I said, you know, do you think, do you think there's something here that, that it could be a show? And they said, sure. And immediately they thought, well, Stefan would be a, a great person to have involved in that mm -hmm. because he's a physicist. He knows a lot about uh, the sort of really low level workings of that thing. Um, so they just said, yeah, let's do it. And then it was really a collaborative effort to, um, you know, come up with what are all these, what are the physics and chemistry demonstrations going to be? And then we put out an open call for artworks and also for uh, scientists. We really tried to say anyone who has some sort of system or cycle that, that you know, resonates with the theme, send it in. And then we went through a ton of mm. submissions, proposals, mm -hmm. and kind of tried to put together a, a really well-rounded show. Mm. See, I knew about that because, I mean, this Leonardo advisory group of the Science Gallery, where every four or five months we meet for two hours and ideas are discussed for, for further, for future projects and so on. So I heard about that. And since I'm a physicist and just out, whatever, 50 meters away is my office and lab, uh, and since I was involved also in the, in the bubble exhibition, they thought, well, it might be good to have you on board. Mm -hmm. And I was, of course, delighted because I'd like to get a bit more physics into the, into the gallery. And uh, all my suggestions were really taken up. So it's, it was good. It was good to work That's great. With, with a team. And you probably can't say you have any preferences, but were there any kind of pieces uh, in the exhibition that sort of... Um, you know, where decisions were made, where we definitely have that, and then from that, other pieces then sort of were, like, how did you put it all together is probably what I'm asking. Like, was there, is there one piece that sort of kicks it all off, or one, did you see some work somewhere else that you said, well, we have to have that in oscillation, or how did, it, yeah. how did it all sort of come together? A big part of it for me was wanting to really represent as, as kind of wide a, a range of, of phenomena and ideas as we could, because really this idea of oscillations if you take it as kind of a lens to look at the world, anywhere you anywhere. go and anything yeah. you look at, you can dive down far enough and you're going to find something. So we wanted, really wanted to have that feeling of it's not just, everyone knows the pendulum, and of course we had to have some pendulums, but it's, maybe they don't know about chemical oscillators, say, or maybe they don't know about the life cycle of a mouse and its daily routine. Mm. You know, there's all these different domains. So for me, that was the overriding thing, is how can we be as broad as possible and get as many different kinds of things so people might come to the show and 
at first be, it might feel kind of scattered, why these things seem kind of arbitrary. Uh, and then as you look at them further, hopefully you realize, oh, every one of these things has some sort of cycle in it. Yeah. Um, a real starting place for me, though, was the, the, the chemical oscillators and the mercury beating heart, and because I think those are things that are kind of fundamental demonstrations, but are very unfamiliar to people. Most people remember pendulums from high school, yeah. but they don't remember uh, cycling chemical systems no. or the mercury beating heart or things like that. So that, to me, was, was an example of something that, that is really fundamental, uh, but quite alien to people, yeah. that you could put together the right mix of chemicals and you're going to get this Color cycle change. that on its own yeah. just keeps cycling through. And I sent my students over to that because I've just been lecturing my second year students in, uh, in chaos and complexity, which is about these kind of cycles. And, and that's one thing that's yeah. what's in there, these chemicals. So it's nice to see that, not just reading it in a book, right. but actually seeing that. And I was talking to you earlier about um, Newton's cradle. You know, the, the, they're actually for sale out in the, in, the, in the shop there. It's, you know, where you have like five balls suspended in a bar. And if you, if you pull one aside, the opposing one will um, bang in the opposite direction. It's based on Newton's law. And I always believe that that would go on forever and ever. But that's not the case, is it, Stefan? That's true. This yeah. is what we learn at school, that if you have these five balls attached from the strings, you bring one out, you let it go, it collides against the other four, and then we learn because of momentum conservation, energy conservation, only the last one will fly out, will come back again. And you've always only one ball in motion, essentially. Now, we've all done the experiment, and had we looked closer, and had we had these preconceptions in our mind, you would say, hey, that's actually not what's happening. And, but then we say, well, but this is just a toy, so it was too cheap. Yeah, it'll probably uh, So it, it's not going to work there. But uh, it turns out the actual physics is much more complicated because you have uh, energy gets, gets lost in these col collisions and thereby eventually all these balls will stick together and the whole thing will move in phase. Now that's not what's in the, in, in the textbook. And even at the very first collision, these pile of balls will break up. Now believe it or not, uh, the Newton's cradle was discussed first, I believe, in 1662 uh, by three guys. Uh, the one you won't know is, is a guy called uh, Wallis, who is known for factorizing pi. The other guy was Huygens, who did lots of work on, on wave principle. Mm -hmm. And the third one was Sir Christopher Wren, who built St. Paul's Cathedral. And they all published on the Newton's cradle. But what I find, I mean, what I find interesting that uh, people still publish on that. It's mm. still not entirely understood in yeah. all its details yeah. how it works. And I published on that myself. That's why I wanted to have that cradle here as well. So it's a nice effect where you think it's very basic science, but as, whenever there's friction involved, dissipation, it gets complicated. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's lots of high caliber teams working on these kind of areas yeah. as well. Have you had to go to play with the Newton's cradle balls out there? No, anybody? I did, and it definitely didn't do what I thought it was gonna do, <laughs> like the toy in the shop. It, pretty, it slowed down pretty fast, and I was yeah. there going, wait, there's something wrong. There's something I'm not doing right. Um, I think that's a nice metaphor yeah. in a way for, for and a way to bridge between the, the more physics-based demonstrations and some of the artworks is that in all of these things, there's a kind of perfect version which is the oscillator, the, 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 the wave equations that describe the behavior. Um, but anything in the physical world, when you get closer and closer to it, that perfect version kind of dissipates. And in a lot of ways, I think the artists are working with, with that as a, as a kind of theme mm -hmm. in that um, there are these cycles and you can, as a human, find these cycles. We're very good at finding patterns, but at the same time, we're very good at fooling ourselves and we're very good at making up patterns where they don't exist or seeing things that we can't quite justify or hoping that something's true that may not be. Mm. And so mm. I think that's a really nice kind of analogy from these simply described physical systems that we still don't quite get um, to, to our perception as humans, which mm. is really on some level all about making sense of the world via patterns. Um, but at the same time, it's, no one has solved it. No, 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 not yet anyway. Um, can you tell me about some of the pieces then? I, I, um, I was immediately drawn to the waves, the one up there in the top corner up there. I don't know if, you've, if any of you have seen it. It's just the two, 
is the two kind of machines um, with a piece of string rotating between the two of them. Can you just tell us a little I, bit more I about I think that? this is interesting because I would have seen that as a piece I could have in my lecture to demonstrate standing waves. Mm. But it has been done by, a, by an artist, yeah. and it's an art piece. Mm. It sort of crosses the boundary or says, well, maybe there is no boundary, or what is it? I mean, I don't care what it is, I like it. I, it I looks like beautiful. It. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. of course, it's had inbuilt that it speeds up if you come closer, which yeah. makes you react to that bit. Uh, but I think that's one of these pieces where, where you see where the science gallery justifies its, its existence, because it's sort of in the middle. Yeah. There's another one downstairs, the pendulum, where you make that uh, passes by the, the these guitar boxes and makes the noises. Yeah. Well, it's a nice it's a nice installation, mm -hmm. and it's somewhere in between. It could yeah. be both. Yeah. yeah, it's it demonstrates physics, but it also has something aesthetic yeah, very about appealing. It. I mean, very you could, if it was more quiet, you could stay or sit in the center and just meditate and you hear <laughs> these noises. You don't know what's going to come next. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the magic cicada piece, the, 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 that to me seems very artistic. It's a yeah. piece you know, where it, it looks at the life cycle of this particular species that lives for seven, only comes out once every seven years? 17. Or 17. Every 17 yeah. years, sorry, every 17 years. Yeah. So somebody, uh, uh, there was a duo that, that made that piece, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so a farmer That's is, a, is an, an artist sound, who yeah. uh, works a lot with bugs of various sorts and she makes these sort of fantastical scenes. And if you look very closely, there's all sorts of detail layered on Beautiful. top of each self. So there's bugs that she's recreated, but then the bugs have little fairies on top of them, and often the fairies hold weapons, or sometimes she makes even larger scale, one with fox heads and this and that. And in this case, she, she collaborated um, with uh, David Rothenberg, a musician who is really interested in insect sounds in general and had been exploring these 17-year uh, cicadas. And so in that one, it's really this kind of fanciful yeah. connection um, but at the same time, I, I think really speaks to what we were just talking about because these 17 year cicadas, there's not a whole lot known about them. Because, first of all, it's very difficult to study something that only comes out and does its thing every 17 mm -hmm. years. Um, and so, for instance, one of the things that uh, David talks about is that the call is much more complex than, than was known previously. And this was only discovered the last time they came out, when someone finally said, well, I'm really going to record these, anal analyze these. And the call has three parts, and previously it was thought to have one, and the female actually has, has a part to play in the call. And so there's all this stuff that kind of came out of it. But then, in the end, their piece is, is really uh, just kind of a notion around is it's like, wow, there's, there's this thing, it's happening, it's a cycle of 17 years, and here's our kind of impression of that thing. So it's not trying to teach you anything, and I think that's really important about a place like the Science Gallery, where some of the things are kind of, you know, have a didactic function maybe, but at the same time, it doesn't ha you don't have to go there and feel like you're learning something no. from the it's, work. For yeah. me, Tessa Farmer's piece is, you're not gonna learn about how fairies ride cicadas, because they don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 we don't know. but you're still going to be really struck by it. Yeah, it's but it's, it's interesting, I mean, 17 years, you could say whatever Halley's Comet passes by every 70 or 80 years, and every 70 or 80 years we have more equipment to analyze yeah. that, and you know a bit more. Yeah. Uh, and so it, that's, you keep it, getting closer You keep getting closer, closer, closer yeah. and hope it's going to make it again. Yeah. Uh, we're going to open up for questions. I mean, I'm going to keep asking questions, but just in, in case you have an overwhelming urge to speak at any time, please do not hesitate. Um, any questions for, for now? I'll keep asking anyway. I'll keep the conversation going. So, yes? There, just get your mic there. Sorry, two secs. In your example there, the, uh, the oscillation was not started by any person in particular. It seems to emerge. Where does it actually start in the... Uh... In the cicada example? Yes. Yeah, well, that's a great question because there is implied in these things that, um, that there is a start, that a, a system has to come together. And I, that's a, a very deep mystery. If you think about life, for instance, life is full of oscillations. Uh, we have no idea where the cell came from, for instance, and how in the world something that complex got kicked off. And there's lots of things that seem like they had to be made they had to exist before they could exist, um, which of course doesn't make any sense, right? So yeah, I, I don't know. You know that system it, it it evolved, and there was something 
you assume beneficial about these insects having a 17-year-old cycle. It's a fairly large prime number. Maybe it had to do with other bugs that you know were, were competing for resources not coming out at the same time or them getting to overwhelm the local eco ecosystem every 17 years when other bugs didn't have quite as, who knows, but somehow all these cycles were resonating. And so the idea of resonance is pretty important in a lot of this. It's that there's certain things about a physical system where that system kind of wants to, wants to go at a particular frequency. It wants things to happen. Somehow 17 years resonated within the, the environment that those bugs were evolving in. Uh, to say why that is, <clears throat> is really hard. I mean, there's an answer. Uh, none of it's mystical. It's just that those answers, man, are, you know, they're, they're far away from, we can't, we still can't explain. <laughs> <laughs> you can't put it quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can get close. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a great question. I don't know. Yeah. Will you tell everybody about the live experiment that happened here last Thursday, which would become a video piece, won't it, as part of the exhibition? I thought this sounded particularly amazing. Sure, the body is yeah, a big place. Yeah, body is a big um, place. So that was an example of a piece that, that um, was very difficult to put on and did require a tremendous amount of mm. preparation. Um, and lots of things had to line up in exactly the right ways. And for a while, it looked like it might not even happen. We were kind of debating, should we devote so, much, so many resources to this thing? But we all agreed that it was just a spectacular um, piece and something we really wanted to have happen. And you know, at its root, it's the idea that the heart beats. And that's what keeps us all going. And um, while the heart seems like this deeply integrated part of us, it seems like it's at the core of, of our system, you can take the heart out, and it'll still beat without you, <laughs> you know? It's like, it's both this deep part of you, but at the same Very time, strange, it's yeah. this pump. And if you put it in the right environment, it's just gonna kinda keep going. And it's, it's a head of a pump. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's, because I mean, we're, we're close to Valentine's Day, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you see that, maybe I mean, it's not that romantic. Pull the heart it's out of this loved one. clump of material who's beaten the hell out of it. Yeah. It's, it's extremely so active. It's very, extremely violent looking. I'd yeah. never seen that before, maybe on, on a movie or something. Extremely violent. It reminded me of sort of a worker who's digging up the yeah. road. So it's, it's pure energy. And I thought that was amazing, mm. amazing to see. And, really and, and like as you said, that, I mean, this is the oscillator that's at the heart Keep of our yeah. existence here. Yeah. Uh, it's a very literal, but also very, obviously, metaphorically, resonant thing and so the performance was you know and we didn't it really was I don't know if experiments the right word but it was it was a chance because there was a good chance it wasn't going to work um, you know transplanting hearts is it's pretty well known how to do that now but it's not exactly straight ahead there was mm. a lot of timing traffic for instance a construction project could have made this not happen mm. if it took too long to get from the harvesting of the heart to here it would have timed out and they wouldn't have beat again uh, which is true for human transplants as yeah. well. Yeah. So we, we just felt the piece was, you know, it, it was kind of on the edge because there's a chance for it to seem like a kind of exploitative thing. It, it, was, it was, you know, or as if, as if it were a shock value or something like that. But we all felt really that that, that wasn't at all the intention. And I think that the people they that actually, were there... They had this show done before with people who had heart transplants. Yeah. So it wasn't, I don't think it was just exploitative. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think it was at all, yeah. Um, and they have that lovely video piece then beside it as well, don't you? Yes, there is a, there's a video that goes with it from the previous yeah. performance. And then we shot a video while it was happening live. And that's going to be in the back of it. So you'll kind of see, because the hearts only beat for a little while. So we don't have them anymore. There's some fluid circulating. But you'll see video documentation yeah. of the of How long the did you have it pumping for then? How long did it last? It went for a while, maybe two hours minutes or something. Oh, was it more? Two hours? No, I thought, it was, no, I thought oh, it was maybe. quite a bit shorter than was that. It? Okay, I can't remember. <laughs> I think it was about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Um, Still great, though. It's yeah. a pretty spectacular thing to see. Yeah, and it worked. We were all very yeah. happy. <laughs> it's know, incredible. It could, it could have just not beat, but it still would have been worse. I mean, that happens sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. We, we felt like that was a risk worth taking, that it still would have been spectacular. And. Um, just in, in relation to the whole exhibition in, 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 in general, was there, is there any particular piece, um, Stefan, I'll ask you first and then I'll ask you Douglas, that you feel a particular 
um, pull towards more, not, not saying there's anything wrong with the other pieces, just that you have a very strong connection <laughs> I'm, 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 with one I'm piece more names, than another. I'm lousy names, but certainly the one where you can stand in the middle and you can listen to these tunes of the swinging pendulum, the I one, find very yeah, nice. That yeah. is it's very appealing. The other one I, I find very funny to look at is where you have a microphone and a speaker, and they communicate with each other. They're trying to pick up the speaker, trying to pick up the, the, the the microphone to pick up the sound, and uh, then a feedback is starting, and then the system's trying to avoid that feedback. So these two, it's like puppets that get closer, and they're sort of courting each other, and then they, they move away. That looks very lively. It, yeah. it's, uh, I'm, I'm surprised that this motion is, it looks so, so natural, you could imagine that. At least you could imagine it's some sort of a popular theater going on there. Yeah, I, like, I think it's like a little dance. That it's like a dance now. or so, yeah. I don't that know what is, the, the dance they're doing. And there you have this example of a pseudo-periodic motion. I'd say you'll never get exactly the same movement here, yeah, but you get something which is pretty close to being the same. And so do, do you know what it is? In, in you that, that, that connects? Like, what is it that, that pulls you to that piece more than anything else? Just on For a, me, it just looks alive. It just looks that, alive. That, that's what okay. makes it uh, yeah. appealing to me. It, yeah. it looks alive and it's, and it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And you, Douglas? Um, geez, there's so many. Well, the, the beating heart certainly yeah. is, is really striking. And uh, the Tessa Farmer, it's, it's really nice because there are a few people, a few artists that I, I already was a fan of their work mm -hmm. and then just by accident, they sent work in to the show, and so having them in there, and Tessa Farmer was certainly one of those, and also um, Kelly Heaton, who has the paintings on the first floor, which are these little bird paintings, but they've got circuits in them, and so she's made these handmade circuits that reproduce bird calls of different sorts. Um, so they're both, they're paintings, they're circuits, but she also has, she's written the circuit diagrams on the paintings, mm. and then has these narratives of, kind of how she got there, what she was thinking about, how she built the circuit, or how she understands or doesn't understand. So I just find they're, they're very rich and they have a lot of um, layers to them. And uh, they, they just, you know, if you're a nerd like me and you want, you know, you can get into the circuit <laughs> diagram and figure out what she did. And at the same time, you can step back and they're just these gorgeous Beautiful. Yeah. Um, paintings. And also the, the piece by Sean Montgomery and Lovid where you go into the blinky room that one just purely from a, a, a sort of hacking your brain perspective. Even if you don't do the experiment, if you just sit there and look at the wall, just weird stuff happens. And there's nothing there. And it's a great example of how easy, you know, your perceptual apparatus is really pretty flaky and, yeah. and unreliable. You know, you, sh you don't really want to trust your own perception. And that makes it very, very clear. Yeah. You just sit there and it's like, what is going on. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cool um, though, isn't it? And all they're doing is flashing, flashing the lights. Nice, yeah. mm -hmm. And what is it that connects to you that with that piece more than another piece? <clears throat> what is it, do you think? I would say more. I, I like, it's just kind of a very stark reminder that as you, you know, I, I do have this predilection for finding mm. patterns and for wanting to make sense of things and wanting to untangle things. And then it says to you, you know, it basically says, good luck. <laughs> Because <laughs> there is there is no because <laughs> yeah, you're really bad at perceiving the world yeah um, because it's so easy it's trivial to sort of mess you up yeah so if I've convinced myself I've untangled some really complicated thing and then it just goes you can't even untangle a light blinking I know why do you think you've solved your relationship with so and so you know yeah yeah so I like it. it's kind of a slap in the face yeah so you're both kind of saying there's humanity in both of what you're saying really yeah. there's something that's connecting. There's a there's a connection for us for looking for some sort of meaning or even even if it's an experiment on some level it's yeah. as you said because it's well, alive. Well, the pendulum can be very soothing, yeah. I suppose. You yeah. look at uh, maybe uh, well, it's called a grandfather's clock, yeah. something mm -hmm. very smooth. There's something familiar tea, about it, isn't there? Familiar. Mm. Uh, I guess you react to that. Yeah, yeah I think so. Have we, any other questions? Yeah, over here. Thanks, Sean. Hey, yeah, I was just curious. Um, there seems to be like a, a lack of pieces that uh, speak to our subjective experience of oscillations. So the sort of nine to five or the way the clock has, you know, divided time mm. that has led to oscillations in our body. And mm. I was wondering where are pieces that you would have liked to have included that would have sort of spoken to this sort of proprioceptive sense of oscillations that are imposed upon us? Well, one of the pieces that it's, 
Unfortunately, it's, it's not as present as we hoped it would have been was nice. the piece with the mouse, the mm. central pattern generator, it's called, which is a piece, if you've seen it, it's right next to the heart piece, and it's just a monitor on the wall. And uh, we weren't able to get permission to have a live mouse in the gallery, believe it or not. It turned out to be a huge issue having a live creature. And what that does, though, is it tracks the daily life, basically, of a mouse. So it's not a human, but there's a lick sensor, and there's a position sensor, and it really basically visualizes a whole bunch of data about what a mouse does every day on a day-to-day -day basis. What's its heart rate? How many times does it go to the bathroom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as you pull out for that, you really see that there are these very predictable cycles of what a mouse does. And if you did it to humans, of course, you would get um, very similar things. So um, that's one of them. Otherwise, we have some talks, actually, that are going to focus a little more on those kind of things, and things like uh, financial cycles, things like uh, cycles in fashion. Um, so yeah, it's kind of infinite. You know, we could have, it's like you have a certain amount of space, and here's what we've filled in. And th that's, to me, why it's, it's an exciting topic, because you really can look anywhere and say, well, oh, there's this cycle going on here. Let's, let's, find, let's find that. Um, so, and maybe that's part of the proposal, I think, of the piece, is to the people who come to it. Like, you can kind of do that on your own. How could I use this as a kind of framing device to maybe for a day think about mm. the world in terms of what are the cycles that are all around me? Um, in what way am I kind of participating in cycles that I'm not even aware of? And in what way maybe am I actually resisting things that the easy thing to do would be to keep doing mm. the same cycle? And how can I kind of push back against that? I'd just like to add a follow to that. And I think it's great. I think it's fantastic that there's such a array of like the bio biology, chemistry, and physics oscillations, and all of them are dealt with. Um, but I guess how do you, when you're curating a show that has to have aesthetic impact, how do you deal with the fact that um, oscillations and pulsars are completely beyond our ability to perceive them, sure. and then some of the really meaningful ones, like inside our cells are also on time scales that are beyond our perception. Yeah. So was it difficult to really tie together how prevalent and important oscillations are on a subjective level? It was. I mean, we kind of made a nod to that because we have some of the photos There's right out here. Photo, yeah. We have the quasar photo. We have a photo of a, of a, sun, of a kind of a hurricane on, a, on the sun. Um, we also have the one bit, one hertz CPU, which is kind of an attempt to really slow down, you know, Modern CPUs are, have billions of times a second. This thing is sort of acting once a second. We have the bacteria so, growing. We have growing bacteria, but, no, but we were very thing, yeah. aware of that. That you know, you can go from the nano all the way up to the the level of, of galaxies and, and further, and it's all. And maybe even the Big Bang is a cycle. You know, so it's it's a tough. It's <laughs> it's a hard thing to do. You pick yeah. something, and of course, you look at what you get sent. Had yeah, there'd be true. maybe an more and more proposal in that area, but yeah. it'd be more likely that we choose something there. Yeah. Uh, so you, you get a list of proposals and you look through them. How interesting do they look? Uh, uh, are, they, are they doable? How much do they cost? Yeah. Sure, there's a lot and of logistics. And then you, you choose something. And the logistics need to, yeah. need to work, and yes. There's also targeted you know, sending the proposal out. For me, one of the things I wish we had been able to do more was have more actual labs involved in having pieces that are about their works. But doing a show like this is kind of alien to a lot of science labs. It's not clear how this would fit into what they do and in terms of their funding and who's going to do it and who's going to come to the show and all that. Because um, there's a lot of other domains. Any lab you go to, there's something they're doing that has to do with cyclical systems. But well, we had some per other performances as well at the opening night. Mm -hmm. yeah. One that I uh, saw was interesting, it was a, uh, a, a composer or a Nick musician, Nick Nitkowski, and uh, he produced a script, a musical script, it was eight bars, and he had a piano player, an excellent piano player, who had to do the sight reading of these eight bars, which he'd never seen, which were computer generated. <coughs> now, once he had played his eight bars, another eight bars appeared on the screen, which was the script of what he had just played. <laughs> so he had to play himself again. And again, and again, and again. Now, 
nobody ever can play the same thing completely twice. It's, it's, uh, uh, I suppose, especially not when you start with something very hard. You could have started with a very simple melody, but the starting point was very complicated. So uh, he was cycling that. You could, you could clearly hear there were some, some bits of it that stayed on and other bits evolved as he was playing. The whole piece was for about 12 minutes. It, it, was, it was fantastic. Yeah, it's a piece and, called Zero Waste. And did it deviate much from the start? It did, it did yeah. deviate from oh. the start, but he sort of zoomed into, it, it zoomed into, into something that in, in physics we might call it as an attractor. He ended up with a certain pattern with some variations around it, but he did end up there. Was it nice to listen to? I, 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 I guess it wouldn't have if you just listened to it, <laughs> but if you see the performance, uh, it was absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I really enjoyed that. And he did it twice. And when, when he, Nick Dukowski, the composer, started off by saying it's, it's not pretty music, but hopefully it's interesting. Oh, no, it's, it, it certainly was. And, I was. and that's another thing that I enjoyed. I was talking to him afterwards because I said, well, can we get that data that you're producing? I'd like to display this in a different way. Because if you display the musical script, I mean, somebody who can't read the notation, well, you can hear it, but you don't see it anymore. But if one comes up with a graphical representation of that, that would be nice. So you could see something is evolving into a cycle or into a square, yeah. or God knows what. Uh, so uh, hope, I mean, he's, he's replied back, so hopefully we're gonna, yeah. we can make something out of that data and yeah. represent that differently. I really think of that piece as a kind of resonance between the performer and their physiology and how good they are at sight reading, oh, yeah, and yeah. then the system that's trying to perceive what they're doing. because. Recording a perform, notating a performance isn't oh, straight yeah. ahead. There's no right answer to what did this person play, and so that's a really nice example of what you get out yeah. is the resonance between those two systems, kind of finding ways to go There's together. different ways of, of of notating a certain sequence yeah, of notes, no uh, and uh, you could just slip into the one or mm. the other case, mm. and then mm. that's changing. But then, if the musician sees it written in another way, he performs it again, differently again. Mm -hmm. Although it was supposed play it the other way. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it, it was, it's it was really very interesting. It was very fascinating. And what would you like to have done to the data, Stefan? We just want, did you want to see that as, as a physicist, or did you want to see that and make something m other from I suppose it? it could have two uh, ways. As a physicist, I would like to see whether I can graphically uh, uh, draw out how this piece is evolving. Yeah. I mean, I can read music notation, uh -huh. not very well. Uh, and I could figure out where it was going to, but it would be better for me if I saw this graphically. It's so a mouse moving around the screen in some way, and then I figure out it's always going to take the same path. So that would be interesting to me. How does it evolve? How is it? It's, sort of a it's just my mic. Pseudo random chaotic system there. How does that evolve? But I could imagine for the uh, for anybody who's observing that, it would make it easier maybe, or you add another dimension to that. So yeah. I would see that in both it yeah. can work in both ways, uh -huh. from a theoretical point of view, but also from a performance enhancing yeah. view. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting area. And you work a little bit in, in, in music and um, you, in, in what you do um, in Columbia. You yeah. Tell us a little bit about your department and what you do in your department uh, I'm music. the director of research at the Computer Music Center at Columbia University. And it's a place where you don't necessarily have to be doing anything with music or with computers. Oh, just so. sounds. <laughs> I just thought, I thought it was a nice segue. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really just a place you, yeah, people come who, who want to try things, yeah. who have strange ideas, and they want to figure out how to do them, and, and we help them do it. So it's really very much in the spirit of this show. Yeah. It's very broad and it's very open. And you know, there, the, it, it comes out of a tradition of electronic music and mm. building instruments and things like that. And now it's just quite broad. It's really, if, if you're somehow using technology or computers or whatever, um, we just help you figure it out. A lot of times it's hard for artists you know, to work with new technologies or yeah. whatever. But you know, lots of artists, as we can see in this show, are, are very sophisticated mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, and we work with scientists, and we work with from all different domains and visualization and all that kind of thing. Mm. So it's really is, it, is, it, is it essentially to make work or to research or to? It's really focus. driven by people's interests. So yeah. at, at Columbia, center has a particular meaning, and it, we're, we're not a program or a major, so people don't come and get a degree from us or anything like that. So it's really you show up, and you want to get involved and do something. And then we say, great, come and do it. That's great. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and, and you're from School of Physics, so you're, you I'm come at this oscillation exhibition in a, in a 
in, in a different way. But yeah. In a way, I can. I mean, I have a main research area, mm. which is foam physics, structure of bubbles and foams. Uh, but I'm also like to try and try out things, experiment things, whatever comes to my mind. That's yeah. why we did this thing on the Newton's yeah. Cradle. I'm working with a, a psychologist at the moment on on on. on pattern recognition or on, on perception of order and disorder. I'd like to do something with that, with Nick on the music. Yeah. It's, it's trying things out. I, I have a little quote here which might fit in, because I think it's important uh, uh, to try out. And this is, a, this is a quote by George Francis Fitzgerald, who okay. was uh, an eminent physicist in, in Trinity. Uh, and this quote is from 1892. And he says there, if universities do not study useless subjects, who will? <laughs> and he goes on, and uh, if there's anybody from SFI here, please do listen. Once a subject becomes useful, it may very well be left to schools and technical colleges to patent mongers and the trade. <laughs> so, uh, in that respect, I see myself in that, in that tradition yes. that uh, I want to try out what I find yeah. interesting. And God knows what comes out of that. Well, it's something like oscillation comes like out that, of that, which is fantastic, example, yeah. of course. Do we have any other questions? Anybody else got any bursting? I'll just to Michael John, somebody behind. So I noticed there's a guitar on the stage. Mm. I was wondering if you were <laughs> planning to use it in any way. I will, I will indeed. <laughs> was I will indeed. surprise at the end. There is a... Uh, at the end of this show, I wrote a, a little, uh, a little sing along. Well, <laughs> I wrote a little number uh, on oscillations, and I'm going to perform that. Looking forward to it. There was another question there. Yeah. Um, I was just curious to know um, if you also include thinking about fractals, for example, um, because it seems like the really interesting bits about oscillations is the irregularities rather than the regularities. Uh, that it generates, maybe. Sure. Yeah, well, one thing, one kind of nod to that is we have the, the double pendulums out there and other kinds of systems that have these kind of chaotic behaviors or behaviors that, uh, you know, intuitively might seem linear, and then as you get closer and closer to them, you realize that uh, they're not at all. We don't have anything that's specifically... We do, we do actually have the, well, the, the, the growth of the bacteria. These patterns <coughs> could be fractal. They, Look, we have to similar look at like fractal. Uh, some of the brainwave activity, some people claim that there's a fractal dimension to that, is that you can, as you kind of zoom out, you see the relationships between the different parts. Um, but I think, I think you're right. Even if it's not specifically fractal, the idea that, um, you know, we, we, we really avoided that you've all kind of seen this, you know, as the idea of, of an oscillation, and you've seen on your computer the, the nice smooth sinusoid. Um, and you'll notice there's really only one. There's that, the, the beautiful piece that is that, but everything else is kind of messy. And it, it's really, for us, that was the way to get into that, was that oscillations, there's, there's the kind of platonic version, which is a smooth curve, and then there's the real version, which is everything else. Um, so we've tried to, I think that's how we've tried to address that, just leaving a lot of messy stuff out there. <laughs> I did a, a, a supervised student project just a couple of months ago where the task was to determine the fractal dimension of Ireland. I haven't published it yet, so of I'm not going to, I'm of Ireland. The of fractal Ireland. dimension of the, oh, coastline, the coastline of Ireland. Yeah, yeah. The coast of Ireland. So I'm not going to tell you the number yet. <laughs> <laughs> but for years I had that set as an exam question. And I actually. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? Because anyway. we're coming to the end, unfortunately, of our lovely Q&A session. Anything else? I've, I have a question for you both, and it's just me, just being nosy. Um, what, I'll ask you first, Stefan, what makes you curious? I get excited about things. Mm. Anything in particular? Anything in particular that makes you just naturally excited about everything? Uh, or? Well, I think I'm a reasonably excited enough person. <laughs> so I do get excited about many things. Uh, if something is interesting, I find out, I mean, whenever you look a bit deeper, yeah. there is something, there's a nugget there. It's, it's more interesting than looking at the surface. I like that. that. Yeah. Uh, and um, again, being in a university, uh, it's nice having 
the young students who are very excited. Bright, young, excited student, that, is, that gets me going. They bring lots of enthusiasm for their project's work. Uh, that's what I enjoy. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. How... Douglas, same difficult question for you. I'm completely against students. <laughs> <laughs> I don't listen to them at all, and they're not allowed to talk to me. Um, I, I think I'm mostly excited about sort of being skeptical about my own uh, perception or enthusiasm or things that I see and, and things that I feel I understand. To me, it's most exciting when someone proposes something that kind of says to me, wait, you, you were wrong about that. Mm. Um, because that's just such an exciting place to be where you're about to dive into something and say, I thought I got this, and it yeah. turns out there's this whole other world. And it feels, I mean, speaking of fractals, it kind of feels like that's the way the world is. You can just keep diving in and diving in and diving in, and there's always some other mm. marvelous yeah. path to follow. Mm. That's true. We'll keep looking, won't we? Uh, any other questions? Oh, one last question here, then. And does oscillation without In a, in, a, you know, in a computer generating, a, mathematically it does, certainly. In real life, I don't think it can. You don't, you don't, we don't have, there's no surface or material, for instance, that's perfect. You Even move in something like, out of equilibrium and it's coming back again. Yeah, that's but not perfectly forever. Oh, no, 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 but I mean, it deviates some deviation. I mean, it, it has to. Right, but he's asking, is there a perfect one? Is there, is there, should have. Is there a perfect one? No, then that's only mathematically, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Even certain, like graphene, for yeah. instance, even these surfaces that are being produced and for, for uh, superconduction and well, things like that, yeah. it turns out that not being perfect is often the most important quality of them. I, I, I bring out my pendulum again, because uh, in, in lectures I always say the way the physicists treat that to get the harmonic oscillator is we say the string is massless, no mass, but it's infinitely rigid. That's the approximation we make. So how come something that's mass is being rigid? Yeah. But it's a good approximation nevertheless. But somehow the world still exists and you know, things, planes still fly. So it's kind of... Approximations. <laughs> <laughs> the approximations are good enough a lot of times. OK, well, I think um, we're going to hear some lovely music now from um, Stefan. We're going to hear some music, whether it's lovely or not, I don't know. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about it, or are we just going to... Just relax a little bit. Uh, maybe I just check with I'm going to just sit over here. Tune. Well, it was a very interesting conversation anyway for me. Um, thank you very much. Um, I hope some of you got all your questions answered. And we learned a little bit more about these two great men and um, what they brought to us for the next couple of months. It's an electric guitar. Mm. It's an electric guitar. Cool. Can I do anything? Do you need me for anything? No, fine. Do you want me to be your groupie? <laughs> bottle of beer or something, but no, it's right. <laughs> it's right. So it's called Good Oscillations. I detect your eyes directed straight at me. It's these electromagnetic waves I sense as I see. They oscillate with speed of light. They are filled without a barn. As you shower me, I see your frown. And I hope you won't do me no harm. I want to pick up good vibrations that are giving me excitations. Yeah, I need oscillations. I'm sick of all these palpitations. As the pendulum swings forth and back in a sinusoidal fashion, it substantiates the fact that repetitive cycles, such as seasons, night at night, are the backbone of our existence, offering eternal delight. I'm picking up good vibrations.
emotions They give me excitations It's all these oscillations They give me good sensation Oh, excitations Sing, I do Or I mutter anyway Kicking these gas molecules around through the air Producing electrical pulses As the sound hits your eardrum That such neurons firing in the brain To the rhythm of my guitar strum I want to send out good vibrations I want to give you excitations So you can see that oscillations are the key To all of our sensations Quantum physics tells us <laughs> that the atoms that we're made of oscillate and gnaw themselves, but waves of the most complex kind, the old in and out in our mind. Oscillation and cooperation. so much. I'd like you to join me in thanking our panel again tonight, Neve Shaw, Douglas Rapetto and Stefan Hutzler. Thank you. Thank you.